lot of you have been asking about uh, hydrogen energy, uh, what's going on, what's the status, what's going to happen, when. And so I'd like to take a few minutes and, and try to address those questions. First of all, a little bit of historical background. Um, I became interested in hydrogen clear back in 1965 when we built the very first automobile to run on hydrogen. It was a Model A Ford. I was in high school. And we converted the Model A engine to burn hydrogen as a science fair project. Um, the idea being that when you burn hydrogen, uh, the only byproduct is water vapor, and so we would eliminate all uh, air pollution. Plus, we wouldn't have to keep uh, using fossil fuels, uh, which is a, a precious resource of our planet and, and certainly a finite or limited resource. As a, a good little high school scientist, after we were able to get the engine to run on hydrogen, and that's, that's a lot of stories in and of itself, uh, we took a, a sample of the gas from the exhaust, took it up to the university and ran it through the gas chromatograph, only to find out that it wasn't uh, very pure. We had a very large amount of a pollutant called nitric oxide in the exhaust. And in our hydrogen engine, we heated it up a little bit higher than a gasoline engine, so the nitric oxide coming out of the tailpipe was much higher than it was for a gasoline car. Uh, nitric oxide, after it's in the atmosphere for a short period of time, combines with more oxygen to form nitrogen dioxide, which combines with water in the air to form nitric acid. Pretty bad pollutant. And uh, one of the main causes of the, the smog in Southern California. So here we were uh, just a couple weeks before the science fair. Our pollution-free car was running, and we could drive around in it. It backfired now and then, but uh, it ran, except it wasn't pollution-free. It was, it was the most polluting car in America. The idea was to make a pollution-free car, but it didn't work. Uh, I left uh, the science fair with a, a nice prize and a scholarship to go to the university. At the university, I wrote a proposal and was able to arrange for Ford Motor Company to fund my research as a freshman and later as a sophomore and a junior and a senior to find a way to get rid of the nitric oxide formation in a hydrogen engine so it would truly be pollution-free. At any rate, uh, after a few years of trying a lot of different combinations, we found that if you would condense water out of the exhaust of the hydrogen engine and then spray the droplets back into the intake, that it would really slow down the combustion and it would make the, uh, the hydrogen burn slower and, and yet it would still burn completely uh, so you didn't have unburnt hydrocarbons like with water and gasoline, but it would greatly lower that peak temperature so the nitrogen and oxygen would not react and form nitric oxide. So there was a, a clean air race, a competition between all the universities to see who could make the most pollution-free car. So we took our, our Volkswagen as our college entry to see if we could, in fact, uh, uh, win the prize and maybe even find out how good the, the pollution level was. And when they uh, got our car in the, the test laboratory on the dynamometer and they started running it through the EPA cycle to test the emissions, uh, they, they stopped in the middle of the test and, and did a lot of things with their instruments. They started again. And they stopped a second time. And finally, the third time, they ran the test all the way through and, and when the, the technician came out of the, the control room with, with the results, uh, I asked him, why did you keep stopping? And he said, well, we had to recalibrate the instruments. I said, why? And he says, because the emissions were so low, we couldn't detect it. We had to go to a higher, higher resolution on the analyzer. 
But when they got finished, you know, there, there are three basic uh, families of pollutants from an automobile engine. One is unburnt hydrocarbons. That's fuel that goes through and doesn't get burned up. The second one is carbon monoxide. That's uh, fuel that didn't get burned completely to CO2. And the third one is nitric oxide. And in this contest, they would take your score of each one of those and multiply it times 100 and add it up. And whoever had the lowest score, kind of like golf, would be the winner. Well, when they got through adding up our score, our hydrocarbons were negative. In other words, there's always some hydrocarbons just in the air, especially in an urban place like Ann Arbor. And as the, the air would go through the engine, the hydrocarbons would be burned up. So the hydrocarbons go into the engine were higher in concentration than coming out. The same with carbon monoxide. They could measure the carbon monoxide just in ambient air, and as it went through the hydrogen engine, it was burned up. And the nitric oxide was only one part per million which meant essentially wasn't there. And as a result of that, when they took one part per million times 100, and then they took minus hydrocarbons, minus carbon monoxide times 100, and add them all up, our total score was less than zero. So we had electric cars that all had a perfect zero score, but our hydrogen car was the only one that, that was negative and the uh, headlines went from coast to coast, uh, car cleans the air as it drives. And Los Angeles, where they had a really bad pollution problem then and, and sometimes still fairly bad, uh, wrote a headline that says this car would probably stall trying to drive in Los Angeles air. But uh, I, I was pretty sure hydrogen was going to really take off, and so we started – putting together the systems to try to commercialize hydrogen. And we did a lot of things. Uh, we built uh, two hydrogen buses, converted a postal vehicle, and operated it for over a year, delivering mail, uh, making sure that that would be an application, because the post office said they'd like to convert their whole fleet, and they're, they're the largest fleet operator in the world. We converted a home. In fact, my family boldly volunteered to live in the hydrogen homestead back in the mid-70s. And uh, interestingly, Mitt Romney's dad, George Romney, who was on my board of directors, cut the ribbon for the hydrogen homestead. Uh, and it was a, a great success. We showed that you can use hydrogen to power vehicles. You can use it to fuel your home. You can use it to generate electricity. Uh, it'll do just about anything so now, how do you get this idea, which is proven technically, so it can be commercialized? Now, this is, this is back in the 70s, and a lot of people know about the work that I was doing back then. Uh, I was on Good Morning America, Larry King, People Magazine, uh, most of the major networks of television, many of the major publications, Omni Science. Popular Science, Scientific American, etc., all telling about these projects and experiments we were doing. But then all of a sudden, I kind of disappeared off everybody's radar screen, or at least I tried to. There was an article a couple years ago in Time Magazine that I didn't disappear from as well as I tried, but a lot of people say, well, well why have you given up on hydrogen? Why have you lost interest? And the fact isn't that I've lost interest, but rather uh, I've learned some interesting lessons. Not everybody is as excited about hydrogen as I am. In fact, there are some people that would probably be able to make more money if hydrogen would just go away. And these are people that are very heavily invested in owning other reserves of oil and and petroleum underground, uh, some people have vast fortunes of oil, and, and they don't really want to see other competing systems come. And there's been, uh, historically, there's been a lot of opposition to the, uh, to the work that we've been trying to do. Uh, someday it'll be time to tell those stories, and, and uh, many people will be surprised at just how hard people have made it for this technology to go forward. 
I thought that if we could get the public on board and get a, a grassroots uh, interest in hydrogen and we could go to Washington, get the government on board, and they would uh, allocate some money and we get this thing cooking. Well, I spent uh, almost seven years of my life testifying before Congress, doing demonstrations, doing projects and tests for the Energy Research and Development Administration and later for the Department of Energy, all to no avail. It, it just became very clear to me that if we want a hydrogen economy, it's not going to be something that comes to us from government. Now, uh, this country really became great because of the ability for a person to pursue their dream. We call it the American dream. And it used to be that if you had a good idea and you were really willing to work hard, that you could take your dream and make it into a, a great success. Well, I'm one of those people that believe that the American dream and the wonderful free enterprise system of this country is still alive. So when I decided that government wasn't really ever going to do anything with the hydrogen, I decided to start doing it on my own. I started doing research on what I thought would be the key to making this whole thing work economically, and that was the hydrogen fuel cell. In 1991, uh, my colleagues and I at the International Academy of Science built the world's very first hydrogen fuel cell car. Why is the fuel cell car so significant? Because it uses only one-third as much fuel, which means it only costs one-third as much to operate. Uh, a hydrogen car running on a hydrogen fuel cell with today's prices of, of producing bulk hydrogen is about a dollar and a half, dollar thirty-five to a dollar and a half per gallon of gasoline equivalent. And that just really beats the prices that we're seeing today. Once the fuel cell car uh, was demonstrated, we immediately had an enormous reaction from the onlookers that did not want to see this thing become commercialized. And uh, so that's when I made the decision that the best way to do this is the old-fashioned free enterprise way. Instead of trying to, to take a flag and charge to the top of the hill with all of the vested interests being against it, what we'd do is we'd just quietly develop it behind the scenes and, and bring it to the market. From my own point of view, I have been working on a uh, solution to the big problem with hydrogen fuel cells for, oh, 30-something years now. And the big problem is that they don't last very long. Hydrogen fuel cells do not have a long enough life to be able to be uh, a good alternative for the internal combustion engine in automobiles. And the other problem they have is they're, they're very expensive. And so I've been doing a lot of work on finding out why the fuel cell has this deterioration problem and also trying to figure out how to eliminate the, the need for so much platinum. Uh, and we've had some, some really, really exciting success. Uh, our fuel cells have now the ability to run seven years, 24 hours a day, nonstop, and they're about as good at the end of the seven years as they were at the beginning. And we've, uh, if you translate that into into driving. That's like driving your car a million miles. I mean, it's it's really uh, better than we ever dreamed it would be. And, and the reason we were able to achieve that is because we had a pretty major breakthrough in, in fuel cell technology, or so we think. But at any rate, we think we have a fuel cell that is um, very reliable. It will have very long life expectancy. In fact, people will probably get tired of their car before the fuel cell wears out. Now, our, our fuel cell is not on the market. It's not written up in any of the literature. Um, and, and a lot of people ask me, well, if you really have fuel cell, why are you hiding it? And uh, it is real. Uh, and it's, it's something that uh, we're not publishing and we're not offering for sale. 
because I have about 20 patents on various aspects of hydrogen energy relating to storage and utilization, etc., all of which have expired. And this hydrogen thing has taken so long to get going that I don't want to start my patent on the fuel cell until people are ready to utilize it. That way we'll be able to maybe recover some of our investment. But uh, the big thing that I'm working on right now is I think going to be a surprise to some of my colleagues when we get ready to publish it. Uh, it has to do with where we get the hydrogen. Now, I'm, I'm one of these old-fashioned type that believes in things like the law of conservation of energy, and there's no such thing as, as a free lunch. You, you, you can't make hocus-pocus energy out of thin air. But using basic principles of science, we've been able to come up with a very interesting way to produce enormous quantities of hydrogen that I think are going to help us launch this technology. And we're, we're getting pretty close to uh, announcing uh, what we've been working on and also offering the fuel cells in, in commercial systems. Uh, it's just going to take an enormous amount of money to do what we plan to do. It's, it's taken a lot of money even to do what we're doing. And so... Uh, where do you get all that money? Do you get it from government? Maybe the people that own the petroleum would like to invest. Uh, I'm doing it the old-fashioned way, the American free enterprise system way. I've started um, three companies uh, early in my career, which we built up, took public, and like I said, we sold them raised a pretty substantial amount of money, which we then spent doing our, our very private hydrogen fuel cell research. Now, I'm in the next phase. We've started uh, half a dozen companies, and this time they're not going public. We're just building them up, and I intend to hang on to them, and now all of the companies are profitable and starting to generate the revenue that will be able to help us uh, launch this hydrogen dream that I've had since my boyhood. Uh, if you're interested, you can, you can see a little bit about some of those companies on my website. I've become involved in a lot of, of different industries, and the whole idea is to generate the revenue so that we can finance this hydrogen dream without uh, needing to rely on government money and other things. And the plan is real simple. Uh, we, we've demonstrated the science clear back in the 70s, and it works. Uh, you, you don't deliver mail for a year and a half uh, with a, you know, a union postal driver without it working. You don't run buses in the Dollarite system in Southern California uh, unless it works. So... The technology is viable, but now we have to make the whole economic, commercial, business thing go together. And so uh, what you'll be hearing from this team is some commercial products coming on the market, and we're, we're planning how we're going to roll this thing out. Automobiles won't be the first market we tackle, but it is the one that I guess I feel the most passionate about. So... Uh, Hydrogen is, is the right answer, and the, uh, the misnomer that people have that it's too expensive or too dangerous, uh, they're just not true. It, it's not too dangerous. In the powdered metal hydride tanks, which I uh, built and patented many, many years ago, and patents are run out on, are very safe. They won't even explode, and uh, it can be produced and used in a fuel cell at a, a savings per mile driven of, of about one-third of what we're paying today for gasoline. So it's it's exciting to, to see this is finally coming about. It's been a dream that I've had for a long time. And uh, a few years ago I wasn't sure, but now I'm, I'm pretty confident that I'm going to get to see this dream be realized. <laughs>